ಭಂಜನಂ ನಿತ್ಯಂ ಅನಂತರೂಪ ಭಕ್ತಾನುಕಂಪಾಧೃತವಿಗ್ರಹ ವೈ ಈಶಾವತಾರ ಪರಮೇಶಮಿಡ್ಯಂ ತಂ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ಶಿರಸ ನಮ ಜನನಿ ಸಾರದಿ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು ಪಾದಪದ್ಮೇತೋ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಮುಹೂರು ಮುಹು ನಮಸ್ತಿರಾಜಾಯ ವಿವೇಕಾನಂದ ಸೂರೈ ಸಚ್ಚಿದ್ಸುಖಸ್ವರೂಪಾಯ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ತಾಪಹಾರಿಣೆ So in the last class we were continuing with our study of the third chapter of Swami Vivekananda's Karma Yoga the third chapter the secret of work the section which we were studying in the last class we ended up with the idea that the detachment in karma yoga which is so often spoken of whenever whenever we speak of karma yoga it is immediately we equate it with the idea that work without attachment and immediately the idea comes as if karma yoga is something like converting ourselves into an automaton i work without any attachment without any feelings as if as such involved in it so the real karma yoga the detachment is not something which is mechanical the detachment comes because of shifting our awareness of being relating our awareness to some another dimension the spiritual dimension of existence and from that the detachment ensues and that detachment results in love so we sometimes find that the detachment and love are as if two uh, opposite terms they are as if antonyms but actually the real detachment which ensues from relating to the spiritual dimension of our existence results in real love the so called love which we designate as love in this world is actually self love it is a type of lust it never speaks of real love we will come to it uh, as we uh, proceed to the text but in just we can say that how by relating to the dimension spiritual dimension of existence we can be detached but at the same time be loving that the example which we gave in the last class if the mother thinks it is she who is always taking care of the child selflessly taking selflessly loving the child it is she who is doing it then in some way or other the attachment is bound to come with the sense of karta with the sense of the doer that it is i who am loving if we really try to find out our own nature is it we who are loving we will find that we are bound to love the mother is bound to like love the child the lord the god of the creation the entire creation has created the universe in such a way to protect his own creation to sustain his own creation he has implanted the love in the heart of each and every mother irrespective of whether he is a human being or even some other animal or any creature you will find the mother is ready to sacrifice the life for the child so from where that love comes is it something the mother herself wills no we are implanted it is implanted in the heart of the mother she has to and that if that idea is always there in our mind then what happens 
then we can feel that it is not we, it is not the parent who has given birth to the child. The parent is just the channel through which God's children has got the scope. The child is God's. He's got a chance to reap his own karma. The parents are just the channel. He's there take, they're there to take care. The God has implanted the love to take care of the children. So they are the mere instruments. So now the real detachment comes. That there is no sense of possession. It is a God who is taking care of creation through me. So now I am not supposed to expect anything. But at the same time, he has created this instrument in such a way that through me, the creation will be taken care of. So let me play my role in the best possible way. And I don't think of the result. Because again, the child who is born, I cannot just impose my wish on him or on her or her. I cannot project that. I cannot just dictate that what he or she should become. Just to give an example, if you have a mango seed, you can water it, you can apply fertilizer, it will become a mango tree only. It's not going to become a jackfruit tree. So the nature cannot be changed. By nurturing, I can nurture the already the inherent nature which is within. So by trying to project my wish, on the children is again another form of attachment, is another form of expectation. So if I understand that the God's creation, God is taking care of, each and every child is born as per his, his or her nature, and that will flourish. I cannot change it. I cannot dictate that what he or she should become. It is going to unfold as per the sanskaras, the hidden sanskaras as the manifest. So now you will find there is no question of expectation. There is, there is not supposed to be any question of suffering. When I know that I have done my job in the best possible way, knowing very well God is taking care of his creation through me, then there is no question of suffering. There's a question of sense of fulfillment that I have done to the best of my ability. Now I leave it to the hand of the divine. So it's not easy. These suggestions have to be internalized in our life. As Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Tablar bol mukhe bola shahoj hate ana koti. That when you, are, when you learn tabla, when you are going to play that percussion, for the first time when you are on the process of learning, the teacher first comes and spells out the rhythm. He will just say that the this is the rhythm which you have to play and he will spell out. And he will ask the one who is learning. You also spell out. It won't take even five minutes to memorize that uh, rhythm and spell it out. But now the real uh, challenge starts. Now the teacher will say, bring it in your hand. Now it may take a weeks, it may take a month. So that's what Sri Ramakrishna is saying. To just to spell out the rhythm is very easy. But to bring it in your hand is not that easy. So when we say that we are the God's instrument through us, God is working. So we, have, we shouldn't have any expectation. But at the same time, we should do to the best of our ability. It's very easy to say. We understand that. It's not very easy to practice. But at the same time, Yes, it's difficult, it's challenging, but it's not impossible. The spiritual journey is something like an adventure. Those who are adventurous, those who take adventurous journey to climb the top of the Mount Everest, they know it very well. It's not easy, it's challenging. But why they try? Because it's not impossible. So when I say it's not possible, that's something where we are not speaking the truth. It is possible. Yes, at the same time, it is challenging. So we have to take up this challenge. Why we have to take up this challenge? Because there is no other way. Nanya pantha vidyate yanaya. There's no other way for attaining the real sense of fulfillment in our life. Unless we can relate to the spiritual dimension and orient our life accordingly. 
So now we will proceed uh, with the Swami Vivekananda's Karma Yoga, the text we will uh, refer to and continue with our study of the uh, remaining portion of his lecture. So this is the thing which we have studied. Just uh, for recapitulation, we read it again where before we proceed to the next paragraph. The whole gist of this teaching is that you should work like a master and not as a slave. Work incessantly, but do not do slaves work. Do you not see how everybody works? Nobody can be altogether at rest. 99% of mankind work like slaves and the result is misery. It is all selfish work. Work through freedom, work through love. The word love is very difficult to understand. Love never comes until there is freedom. There is no true love possible in the slave. If you buy a slave and tie him down in chains and make him work for you, he will work like a drudge, but there will be no love in him. So when we ourselves work for the things of the world as slaves, there can be no love in us and our work is not true work. This is true of work done for relatives and friends and is true of work done for our own selves. Selfish work is slaves work and here is a test. Every act of love brings happiness. There is no act of love which does not bring peace and blessedness as its reaction. So this, which, this is the portion which we studied in the last class and we tried to have uh, the explanation of it as much as possible. Now from today, we are going to proceed with this new text. Real existence, real knowledge and real love are eternally connected with one another. And the three, uh, they are three in one. Where one of them is, the others also must be. They are the three aspects of the one without a second. The existence, knowledge, bliss. So in our scripture, we say that the absolute reality, the ultimate reality is of the nature, Sat Chit Ananda. So this real existence speaks of Sat Swarupata. Real knowledge speaks of the Chit Swarupata and the real love speaks of the Ananda Swarupata. This Sat Chit Ananda. That's what Swami Vivekananda is referring here to. Now when we think of the ultimate reality as Sat Chit Ananda. Now very interesting. In our scripture, the absolute reality has been spoken of as nir upadhik. There are no attributes. And now I say that absolute reality is sat chit ananda swarupa. Then apparently it, we feel that there is a contradiction. We say that the absolute reality is beyond all attributes. Then how from where this sat swarupata, chit swarupata, ananda swarupata, comes into existence. So actually, when we speak of the nature of the absolute reality as Sat Chit Ananda, it's not actually the attributes of the absolute reality. It's rather the negation of the idea of limited individuality which we have. That I think that I was born at certain point of time. I'm going to die at certain point of time. And I'm going through constant changes, shara vikara, six types of transformations, jayate, asti, vardhate, viparinamate, apakshyate, nasti. That we are born, jayate, we exist, asti, vardhate, we start, we grow. After some time in the middle age, the transformation starts, the growth stops. That is viparinamate. And then apakshyate, the decay process starts. And at last, nasti, the negation. Our existence is not there. So this is the idea of our limited existence is. But in our scripture, they say, what is sat? 
that which is three kal avadhit whose existence is not interrupted by any phase of time past present future it was in the past through eternity it is in the present it is going to be in the future through eternity so now to negate this idea of this limited self which we have at present that i was born at certain point of time i'm going to die at certain point of time and i'm going through changes to negate this uh, creation annihilation and change the scripture said no actually really you are sat swarupa the real you is beyond any uh, limitation of time it is the trikal avadita satya it was it is it will be now the science is there to say yes what you say is correct the world energy and matter is interconvertible and nothing gets destroyed at last so consciousness which we have is an epiphenomenon because of the interaction of matter and energy somehow it has evolved but you remain as matter as inert matter in some form or other you were the stardust which has taken the form of this living entity so that's what the science the apparent science may say the real science is of course proceeding in a different direction now that's what they say so here again the scripture assert that no the sat swarupa that which we speak of is chit swarupa it is that the knowledge it is the conscious principle it is consciousness is not the ap phenomenon it is the only fundamental universal substratum of the entire universe what i call matter that actually is nothing that is there is no thing in matter there is no thing that's what's nothing there is no thing in matter the consciousness is appearing as this universe of in the form of energy matter what we say so the real you is that non dual conscious principle that sat swarup is chit swarup also and then again the doubt comes that yes even in my limited existence i find what i find that the chit swarupata which i know that i exist but i am not happy i always go through this uh, duality of joy and sorrow pleasure and pain there is no thing as such called as that uninterrupted happiness uninterrupted bliss so immediately the idea comes that even if i am chit swarup i am sat swarup but most probably through eternity just i am in a pitiable condition just like a particle being carried by the waves sometimes in the top in the crest of happiness and sometimes in the trough of depression and it goes on through eternity is this such is the such is the wretched condition of my existence so again the scripture says no the real you is ananda swarupa it is full of bliss there is no question of suffering in it so now you will find that when the scripture speaks of sat swarupata chit swarupata ananda swarupata it's not the attribute of the absolute reality it's actually the negation of the limited idea of individuality which we have and that's what swami is speaking of as a real existence real knowledge and real love and the real bliss they're all eternally connected the ultimate reality which is sat is chit and that again is full of bliss they are the three in one where one of them is the others also must be so they are the three aspects of the one without a second the existence knowledge bliss when the existence becomes relative we see it as the world that knowledge becomes in its turn modified into the knowledge of the things of the world and that bliss forms the foundation of all true love known to the heart of man so it is that bliss the same bliss which is finding expression as the human love that we somehow we know that we are are mortal but somehow a feeling is there within us 
of immortality. We are, that's why we always try to uh, conquer mortality through constant this medicine, yoga, whatever you may say. Why we are trying? That something within us says that you are immortal. You are chit swarupa and you are full of bliss and the bliss finds expression through love. In the Upanishad, this bliss and love has been spoken of very nicely. That the he, the ultimate reality was one. He was alone. And he wanted to that be many. The expression that the Ladini, in, the, in the Bhakti Shastra they speak of the Ladini aspect. That the aspect of bliss, the love, that wants to manifest through expression of bliss. But there cannot be bliss unless there are there is two who is relating to each other through love. So the Lord who was one, who became many to interact with the creation through love, to enjoy his own bliss. So that same I, this bliss is in us, which was impl- which is actually the nature of the divine. So here that's the thing, there's all the human love, the bliss which we find is actually the bliss which emanates from that absolute reality. So in its turn, modified with the knowledge of the things of the world and that bliss forms the foundation of all true love known to the human heart. This, r- real, this love can be really felt when we can go beyond all selfishness. When we really realize our satsvarupata, chitsvarupata, ananda svarupata and come back from that state, then that love without the tarnish of selfishness can be experienced in life. There's a wonderful uh, mantra in uh, the Upanishads in one of this, what's that? Dehabhimane galite vigyate paramatmani yatra yatra manoyati tatra tatra samadhaya. So when through our spiritual practice we ascend to the pure amnes, the ego obliterates, the ego falls off. Sri Ramakrishna used to give a wonderful example that the ultimate reality is something like as a, as a upama, as a simile, he's giving the example of ocean. Just think of the ocean, boundless ocean as something like your, that non-dual consciousness. And what's the ego? It's just like a pot. You immerse the pot in the ocean. That infinite ocean now gets demarcated a little of its water has entered into the pot and now I say it is pot water. It is the same ocean water because of the pot it has got demarcated. And now what happens? The waves of the ocean no more disturbs the water inside the pot. It has got segregated by the outer covering of the pot, outer layer of the pot. So that pot is like the ego. The moment the ego comes into picture, we cannot relate to the world. Our so-called love becomes a duty. It is not something which flows from our heart. We don't feel it. Yes, someone is going through some suffering. It's our duty to go and sympathize. It is more like a lip sympathy. We don't feel it from the bottom of the heart. Why? Because the more we are bound in the ignorance, the more stronger is our ego, the more we are obliterated, the more we are separated from the, our, this non-dual consciousness, from the non-local consciousness. And that's the thing, it's very interesting. Sometimes we may think that it is something which is poetic. Does it really have any uh, truth in it? You will find, uh, even in the last some class we were indicating, that uh, the small children very easily relate to each other's emotions. They're all playing together. One child falls, starts crying. It's a very common thing. You will find the other children immediately start crying. As a small child's ego is something very, very thin. It's not there almost. Very easily they relate to each other's emotion. Sri Ramakrishna seeing others just uh, quarreling. One person hit the other person. There was Mark uh, on Sri Ramakrishna's back. He felt the pain. 
And we sometimes feel these are all mystific mystified uh, incidences. Actually, we can not understand because our ego is so strong, we can never relate to such incidents. It truly happens. You're, when the ego falls off, you start relating to the world through empathy. You just feel it. You know, even in the animal kingdom, for humans, the ego is so strong, we can never even imagine such type of uh, state of our existence. Very, some very funny incidences are there in the animal kingdom. Uh, I mean, uh, not in the animal, the fun is not in the animal kingdom, it is something natural, but the way we tried to interpret it was something really funny. You know, if you see, if you watch the birds flying, uh, they are always flying in a flock in the sky. And a very interesting thing you will find, a flock of bird flying, and suddenly they will take a turn towards the right or towards the left. And it's almost instantaneous that the, all the birds will be turning uh, in the right. When the birds are turning, it's not that someone is commanding. It's not like that when uh, in our drill, in a parade, the commander is there to command and then all turns. For the birds, it happens spontaneously. When there's a, a fish as, are swimming, a sprawl of fish, they also turn almost immediately. And now, you know, a few decades back, a group of scientists were really uh, puzzled by it, that how it happens. And they started a research on it. That why not we try to find out that how they do it. Then what will be the result? What is the utility of that type of experiment, research? Now then there won't be any uh, cause of, uh, there won't be any accident in the road. If I know the car which is proceeding suddenly in which way it is going to turn, then uh, this, I can avoid the accidents. Now, even by mistake, it is supposed to take turn on the left, but it takes turn on the right, but I can find it out well beforehand and I can avoid accidents. I can avoid traffic jams. Without the signal, the traffic can work quite normally. So this was their intention. And at last, they come, came out with, a, with the answer, which is really something very interesting. They told a very interesting thing. That there is something called non-local consciousness to which these creatures, these animals can relate. We cannot relate. So see, what a wonderful thing. It's even they, these animals sometimes out of, because for them, they are not have evolved spiritually, but for them, the ego, their instinct has made their ego to somehow uh, diffuse with the totality, with the collective. And they also sometimes relate in, in such a way that so many things happen spontaneously in the animal kingdom. In even you will find in our, uh, the animals, this instinct is very strong, the dog, just at the time when you are supposed to return home, it will become restless. Uh, so some, uh, some person left it, I read it long back in the Reader's Digest, uh, that one person left for some seminar, went, uh, and he, just, he was supposed to return one week later. And the pet, the dog, after three days, suddenly it started just moving out and going out of the house, standing in the door as if expecting someone and again coming in. It used to happen when that person used to return from office every day. And now the other members of the family were quite puzzled that why he's behaving that way. And they suddenly saw that the man is returning, the person has returned. And they asked that you were supposed to return after one week. What has happened? Why after three days you have returned? Well, the seminar was canceled for some reason. So he returned. He never felt of informing the family members. He simply came back. The dog somehow came to know that the master is returning. So it happens with the twins. The twins have a very wonderful bond of love. You will find if one gets the fever, the other will get the fever. It, and not only that, there are so many incidences that one uh, of the one among the twins was at was at home. The other went for some game play with the went for playing with the other children. The one who was at home started suffocating suddenly. The parents never knew why. 
So somehow they rushed out of the house to in search of the other twin and they found that the children came to quarrel and there was the swimming pool nearby. The one child was trying to suffocate by put, putting the ch other child down into the water. And this child sitting in the home room, in his home house without seeing was suffocating. There are so many incidences. This picks when the, through the love, the ego barrier falls off. You immediately start relating through empathy. You're just, it's no more remains others pain. The skin is no more the boundary. You start feeling the pain of others, the suffering of others. You start relating to the other's emotions. So that's, that, that thing happens when through spiritual practice, your ego obliterates. More and more you start relating to that diffused non-local consciousness. So uh, let us go to the text to, uh, therefore true love can never react so as to cause pain either to the lover or to the beloved. Suppose a man, now Swamiji is saying something interesting that what we think of love is actually infatuation. So now Swamiji is giving an example. In nowadays, this example is more relevant where we find that family violence has become a rampant uh, reality. Is something uh, of the modern society? This why, what's the basic cause of all those family violence? So here you will find Swamiji is given an example that how that the love gets converted into such a violent form. The love transforms into something violence, how it happens, because that was not a real love. That's the example Swamiji is giving. Suppose a man loves a woman. He wishes to have her all to himself and feels extremely jealous about her every movement. He wants her to sit near him, to stand near him and to eat and move at his biding. He is a slave to her and wishes to have her as his slave. That is not love. It is a kind of morbid affection of the slave insinuating itself as love. It cannot be love. So, you know, that one of the major factors that that's what we are saying is of family violence is this disease of suspicion that love, it is not love, that I am actually slave of her. I want to totally control her, him or her, whatever it may be. And this suspicion results in the, what in Gita has been called off as Abhis Sneha. It's infatuation. It's not Sneha. It is Abhis Sneha. Very interesting in Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna is speaking of the various traits of his Titha Pragya, the one who is established in his own wisdom. That what are the various traits of such person? So while speaking such, in one of the slokas, he speaks of this wonderful trait. Yeah, Sarvatran Anabhisneha. It's a very interesting word. Anabhisneha. And then after all the slok proceeds, Tatra uh, Prapya Shubha Shubham Nabhi Nandati Nadveshti Tasya Pragya Pratishtita. So Abhisneha, there's a difference between Sneha and Abhisneha. God is not. Krishna is the Lord is not saying that you should not have sneha. What you should not have is abhis sneha, un abhis sneha. Not that you should lack, uh, lack sneha. Love is good, but the love which finds expression as infatuation, that is bad. What is the difference in abhis sneha? It is actually I love myself. Uh, in uh, when I was in uh, uh, the, in a residential school, some of the parents sometimes after admitting the child would come to take them back. They actually admit and knowing very well that it's a very good school. It has very good uh, standards. It maintains very good standards. So willingly they came to leave the child. And after a few days, the mother cannot stay without the child. She comes and says, I will take the child back. Then we used to ask, is it, isn't it you who have decided, thinking everything very well, you have decided that you will admit the child in this residential school? Yes. Now, why do you want to take him back? 
because I cannot live without him. So then we used to point out, it is you who cannot live without him, isn't it? So it is your problem. It is you, it is you actually you thought that this school is going to be good for him. You brought, it's not that we are going to uh, stop him from taking, uh, to take you, you can of course take him back, but just think, is it really something to do with the child's education or it is just your morbid affection? It is just like it is because you cannot stay without the child. So now you're not, the child's uh, welfare is not your priority. What's the priority? Because you yourself decided for the child's welfare, this school is good. So now that is no more your priority. The priority is your feeling of that, that wellness. That has become the priority. So is it love? It is that morbid affection. So all, most of the time you will find, to try to find out that what is love and what is infatuation. Anything which speaks of self-love in the name of love. That loving such and such person gives me a sense of good feeling. That's why I love. So that is infatuation. That is not real love. The real love is that I become secondary. The good the welfare of the other person becomes a primary thing. Even if that entails suffering, I'm ready to, I'm ready to undertake any suffering for that. That's the real love. So explaining uh, the trait of uh, the sthita pragya, that's why the Bhagavan Krishna used the word anabhisnaya. So this abhisnaya is something uh, it's like an autoimmune disease, you know. All the family violence is actually something like autoimmune disease. What's the autoimmune disease? The immune system, our immune system is there to protect us from the microbes, from all the infectious diseases. But sometimes this, our immune system, something like being over suspicious, starts killing itself. It becomes its own enemy. And various type of autoimmune disease is the result of that. You can easily equate the family violence with this autoimmune disease, where the family was there to complement each other just because of being overprotective. You harm the one whom you are supposed to protect. And in the, in the long term, you damage yourself. So that is not love. That is insinuating itself as love. So it's a, just a morbid affection. It cannot be love because it is painful. If she does not do what he wants, it brings him pain. With love, there is no painful reaction. Love only brings a reaction of bliss. If it does not, it is not love. It is mistaking something else for love. When you have succeeded in loving your husband, your wife, your children, the whole world, the universe in such a manner that there is no reaction of pain or jealousy, no selfish feeling, then you are in a fit state to be unattached. So that's, now you will find that what Swamiji is saying with the discussions which we had. So when you know that, God, that the love within you is, been, is something which is divine, the God is, in the, in the Bhagavad Gita, the idea of yajna is pervading the almost entire Bhagavad Gita. Yajna, yajna means interdependence. This world, nothing is, uh, nothing can exist segregated. We are all interdependent. That's the idea of yajna. That is the programming of the universe, that yajna, it has to be interdependent. And if I know that, and I can just understand, realize that the love in me is because of the yajna, because of my participation of the yajna, which has been implanted by God, then all the expectations falls off. And there's no question of reaction. When I love others, they misunderstand me, they react but I don't get hurt by that. Why? Because I know that it either the love which is emanating from me is God's. 
it is not me it is not i who am loving and there is no question of expectation the world is in its journey to the perfection each and every being is in its own stage of evolution i cannot expect all to be behaving in a very sublime manner each has to go through this course of experience to really evolve so it is quite natural quite evitable that people will be behaving in untoward ways because they are yet to refine themselves through proper evolution they have to go through the experiences of life so it is quite evitable that people will behave differently some may praise me for that i should i shouldn't be elated some may hurt me <clears throat> for that i shouldn't be dejected so that's the idea of na abhinandati na dveshti that one who has who is not having that abhisneha that means he is having sneha not abhisneha for him shubha ashubha nothing affects he never elates uh, for when he gets the all everything is good for him and never even uh, starts hating others when uh, things are not going well with him so he has gone beyond shubha ashubha he is never na abhinandati abhinandati is never rejoices nor gets elated na dveshti nor he hates his pragya his wisdom is now established tasya pragya pratishtita so that's the idea swami ji is uh, uh, just indicating uh, through this passage so when you have succeeded in really loving that is sneha that is not a abhisneha is loving your husband your wife your children the whole world the universe in such a manner that there is no reaction of pain or jealousy no selfish feeling then you are in a fit state to be unattached now the lord is giving his own example krishna says the swami is quoting krishna what in bhagavad gita look at me arjuna if i stop from work for one moment the whole universe will die i have nothing to gain from work i am the one lord but why do i work because i love the world god is unattached because he loves that real love makes us unattached so if you see the life of krishna he is the king maker he kills kangsha and he is not the one after killing kangsha he himself is claiming the throne so everywhere he is the king maker after the mahabharata yuddha the he is the one who is the deciding factor of the entire world he is just on that uh, to establish the righteousness he is there but at the same time he has no selfish ends out of it after the war he leaves for dwarka so that's the thing you find in the entire life of krishna that's what he is indicating in bhagavad gita he is exemplifying himself he is pointing to arjuna see my life name parthasti kartavya in the third chapter 22nd shloka in bhagavad gita name parthasti kartavyam trishu lokeshu kinchan nana vaptam avaptavyam varta evach karmani so there is no duty for me to do in all the three worlds of partha nor do i have anything to gain or attain yet i am engaged in prescribed duties why out of love just love for the creation there's nothing there to bind him he is there to make to so just fix the things and he moves out so that's the real way to relate to the world if you really want happiness so that real love comes from an attachment whenever there is attachment it is a self love which finds expression as love so god is unattached because he loves that real love makes us unattached so in bhagavad gita we find the uts there's there are other shlokas also where the same idea is being expressed by the lord this utsi utsi de rime loka na kuriya karma chedaham if i cease to perform prescribed action all these worlds will perish so no just just now we were speaking of that we cannot prove that the mat from matter consciousness has evolved but you cannot explain matter without consciousness 
uh, I won't go to the details. Why that? That if the Lord is not working, means you know, in our scripture they say, very these words are very important. That God is animation. Means our eyes are constantly winking. Our vision is constantly getting interrupted because of the winking. But God's eyes never wink. It's a very wonderful idea. You know, there's a wonderful experiment in physics. It's called the double slit experiment. I'll just give a, a, a rough idea of it. Just to say that how science is also gradually knocking at the doors of consciousness. They cannot deny there is a really a wide section of the modern, especially the in the quantum uh, physics, there is a, a section of the scientists who have started uh, that uh, taking consciousness as one of the fundamental aspects of this entire universe, without which I cannot explain anything. So the double state experiment is a very interesting thing. What's that? To find out the nature of electron, whether it is matter or whether it's energy. So what they do, they will uh, spray from a gun of electrons, they, the electrons are sprayed out and it has to pass through two slits. And after passing through two slits, two windows, there's another screen beyond the two splits. And on the screen that all the electrons will go and strike there. Now, if they're particle, uh, then what will happen? As they're passing through two slits, they will make two spots in the screen behind the slits. And if they're wave, then there will be dark and light fringes. When two waves intermingle with each other, when there are two crests of the wave uh, into just uh, what you say that will be touching each other, that will be intensified. So that will create some illumined spot. And when the crest of the wave uh, touches with the trough of the other wave, they will cancel each other. The dark spot will be created. So there will be a band of light and uh, dark uh, this spots. If there, if there will be light and dark bands. So if it is a wave, there will be light and dark band. And if it is a particle, there will be spot, two spots. Now, very interesting. Previously, when they have passed it only through one slit, there was a spot which shows that electron is a particle. Now, when they pass through two slits, they see the fringes, the dark and light fringes, the dark and light bands, which speaks that as if the electron is energy, it's not matter. Now the scientists were puzzled. What's its real nature? When, I, when it passes through the single slit, it appears as a particle. When it passes through the both two slits, it's appearing as a wave, What's its real nature? Now to find out what's going on, they kept a camera to observe what's going on in the screen. They kept the camera on the level of the two slits to see what's going on the screen. The moment they kept the camera to observe, now instead of waves, they were behaving like particle. They were two spots. So now we are not going to the details, just to say what the moment there is an observer, the probability, the wave is like a probability, it collapses into reality. So the science, this, the science have started saying, the, because of the quantum, uh, this physics, they have started saying, what I see as reality is not possible unless someone is observing. And who is observing? It's not me or who, uh, you who are observing. My observation, your observation are all linked to the observation of God. That's like the cosmic mind. We are all the part of that mind. It is the cosmic mind who is animesha, who is constantly observing. If he stops observing for a while, if he winks, creation is gone. There's a wonderful conversation between Rabindranath Tagore and Einstein. Einstein himself was puzzled as he was from Abrahamic religious background. He believed in the design theory that God has created the universe, he has designed. And when this quantum mechanics, all the researches, discoveries started coming, he himself was puzzled that unless someone is an observer, the thing is not there. 
but it was not difficult for rabindranath from the oriental background to relate to it from vedantic perspective and there's a wonderful conversation between the two great minds once they met and there was a great conversation so that showing a statue einstein asked that if i am not observing it does it exist rabindranath deny says it doesn't exist well how come well yes that's the difficult thing to understand because i am not observing but the cosmic mind that is the thing observing With, without that observation nothing in this universe exists even the double state experiment points to that that the, it they gives a wonderful example that what's the example like that what's the creation is like it's just like a classroom where the teacher is not there the children are hustling and bustling running about the principal sitting in his office senses that something is going on the children are restless so he comes down the corridor to see what's going on in the classroom and by the time he comes and stands near the door of the classroom he finds everything is quiet just seeing the principal all the student took their position the thing the haphazard thing means all the thing which was a probability the chaos it collapsed into reality just by the observation of the headmaster of the principal so that's what is happening with the creation so god is unattached but at the same time if he stops working even for a while the creation falls off so even from that high perspective we can relate it is not only that krishna's life in this world even from that absolute point of reality it is he is the animator he is unceasingly just going on doing his work to sustain his creation so without if he ceases to perform his action even for a moment the world perish so that's being indicated so where so let us just again uh, refer to the text where there is attachment the clinging to the things of the world you must know that it is all physical attraction between sets of particles of matter something that attracts to bodies nearer and nearer all the time and if they cannot get near enough produces pain but where there is real love it does not rest on physical attachment at all such lovers may be a thousand miles away from one another but their love will be all the same it does not die and will never produce any painful reaction so now swami ji continues to attain this unattachment is almost a life work that's what we were saying tablar bol mukhe bola sahaj hate ana kothin that it's easier said than done so it's it is almost a life work but as soon as we have reached this point we have attained the goal of love and become free so it is very difficult but it is not impossible so as soon as we have reached this point we have attained the goal and become free so that's what is been spoken of by chaitanya mahaprabhu he used to say atma rati kama krishna rati prema then when that love has crossed the ego boundary it doesn't take the ego as the primary the others interest becomes the main concern so that is the real prema so when you see the lord in each and every being and love the divine in each and every form so that's the prema otherwise all the love is just atmarati it appears as love but actually it is we who love ourselves it's not the other person by loving the other person i feel good that's why i love so that is atmarati so to attain this non attachment un attachment is almost a life work but as soon as we have reached this point we have attained the goal of love and become free the bondage of nature falls from us and we see nature as she is she forges no more chains for us we stand entirely free and take not the results of work into consideration who then cares for what the results may be so this is an idea wonderful idea the moment you see the nature as she is she forges no more chains for us 
In the words of Ramakrishna, Maya ke chinle Maya palai. The moment you recognize the real nature of nature of the nature of nature, it flees. So that's the idea behind saying stop face the brutes. In so many ways, these ideas are the same ideas are being reiterated to explain. When Swami Vivekananda was in Kashi as a wandering monk in Banaras, once he went to visit the Durga temple and while coming out from the Durga temple, the exit is such that on the one side there is a reservoir and on the other side there is a wall and the road through which you have to pass is a very narrow road and there is no way you can move. One side is the wall, other side is the reservoir. And as he was passing through that narrow street to come out of the temple, he suddenly sensed that a pack of monkeys is following him, chasing him. They were almost at his heels. And now he got extremely frightened, scared. He started running. The more he ran, the more he ran, the more the monkeys chased him. And Swamiji knew not what to do, means he was so scared. And suddenly he heard an old monk from a distance shouting, stop, face the brutes. Swami Vivekananda stopped hearing that, turned around and just faced the monkeys. An interesting thing, the monkeys immediately stopped chasing. They were also staring back at Swamiji. For some time, both were staring at each other. And then he found a wonderful thing. The monkeys are receding, are going back. Swamiji, after this incident, he just reflected, I have learned the lesson of my life today. What's that? Never run away. Stop. Face the brutes. So once you face, the problem starts falling off. Once you face, know its real nature, it starts falling off. Swami uh, Ramakrishna also used to say that almost the same type of story that a group of children were playing and an elderly person just uh, was wearing a bare skin came there to scare the children. The children were scared, they were shouting, howling. Suddenly one of the children, a small girl, she recognized, she told, oh, it's our uncle. It's our uncle who is disguising himself to scare us. The moment the girl recognized that who that person is, immediately that elderly person removed the bare skin because now he knows that his purpose won't be served. He has been recognized. So the moment you recognize the nature, how it works, you know it, that it is the mental modules which is taking the preponderance one at a time and it has its own set of stimuli response conditioning and it is making me feel that I am the one who is deciding but actually it is deciding. Once you know that, it cannot be fool you anymore. You set back, you don't identify with them. You don't, you no more get pampered by them and they start falling off. That's the thing we were discussing. So that's how the bondage of the nature falls from us as we see nature as she is. She forges no more chains for us. We stand entirely free and take not the results of work into consideration. Who then cares for what the results may be? So with this, we conclude our discussion today. We'll continue with the next pair from the next paragraph again in the next class. With this, we... Namaskar, Swamiji. Ah, Namaskar. Pranamara. Thank you, Swamiji. Namaskar. 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 Namaskar.